It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. The price of your mobile phone battery. Sky News finds children as young as four digging for minerals for just eight pence a day. More charm, less cheap rhetoric. Sir John Major sharply criticises Theresa May over Brexit. Torture, sexual abuse and slavery. The British children sent abroad for a better life who suffered for decades. Return to Tunisia ahead of the final report into the deaths of 30 British tourists. The country's government tells Sky News it is safe to go back. No risk to patients. The health secretary insists patient safety was not compromised by a huge NHS data loss. Plus, La La Land. This is not a joke. Moonlight has won Best Picture. Moonlight, Best Picture. The company behind that Oscars mistake makes a public apology. And we'll take a look at tomorrow's front pages. That's coming up in the press preview at 10.30. Hello there, good evening. It is an essential part of mobile gadgets found in every home. But tonight, Sky News can reveal the terrible human cost of extracting cobalt from the earth. A Sky News investigation has found children as young as four working in dangerous and squalid conditions in African mines for as little as 8p a day. Well, most of the world's cobalt supply comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the poorest countries in Africa. We've been to several mines in the south of the country where the minerals are often dug out by hand by very young children. From there, our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, sent this exclusive report. Children are mining the cobalt, which could be in your smartphone. Go get your sack, Dorsan is told. There's an urgency now. The rains make this a lot more risky. Dorsan's threatened with a beating if he messes up again. The little boy with Richard, who's not much bigger, next to him, have worked all day already. They are 8 and 11 years old. This is what helpless looks like, and he's one of the children making millions for multinational corporations in America and China whilst they suffer in squalor. For this, they'll get maybe eight British pence a day. The tunnels are dug by hand with no supports. They frequently collapse during rain. The miners climb down, often barefoot, using holes carved in the rock. They have no protective masks or protective equipment at all. And right at the bottom, I can see water. There are thousands of these unofficial, unmonitored mines. Men, women and children work in virtual slave conditions. Millions have died in decades of fighting over these mineral riches. There's gold, tin and copper here. Now the new American president looks set to repeal laws brought in to protect these people and stop the flow of cash to militias. Much of the DRC's minerals are extracted manually, but we found there are already few checks to ensure against the exploitation of these people by either rebel groups or multinational companies. Particularly vulnerable are those mining the country's vast cobalt wealth, often picked out by tiny hands. Most of the world's cobalt comes from here, and it's now an essential part of lithium-ion batteries which power smartphones and laptops. We visited five different mines across the south of DRC and found all used child workers. Monica is the youngest worker in this group at just four, but even those barely able to walk have lost their childhoods to mining. The children's cobalt is then sold cheaply to mostly Chinese traders who we film secretly. They don't ask questions about where their cobalt comes from or who's worked to extract it. 
They just want the best price. <coughs> the risks are enormous, the rewards few, and the little protection for them is now threatened. <laughs> Many others, like Dorsan, will be back again tomorrow, digging out one of the most sought-after minerals of our time for a pittance. Alex Crawford, Sky News, in the DRC. Well, Alex Crawford is back from the DRC and is here now. So, Alex, what can be done to address this? Well, I think there are a number of different players involved in this, so there is a lot of culpability along the line. The first one has probably got to be the DRC government who knows this is going on, but has not regulated anything and has not monitored anything and is in many ways complicit in it along the line. You know, government officials taking bribes or turning the other way or just ignoring it. So they've got to be the main um, culpable player in this. Uh, there are, is also obviously a, multi, a very chaotic supply chain with a number of different players involved in that on a personal level and on, and on different levels in, the, in that regard and it starts with the traders so you know you start at the bottom you carry your sack like Dawson does you try and sell it to someone they then sell it on uh, that then goes to the big Chinese company which is dominant in the area that then goes to the biggest battery maker and the thing is how do we know that this is all coming from uh, DRC because they produce 60% of the cobalt in the world so I think this is where the consumer comes in and the international community putting pressure on the millions of pounds being made by these multinational companies at the end of the chain. Are you absolutely sure that you have done everything you can to make sure that it doesn't lead right back down to Dorsan? Alex, thank you. Well, tomorrow our technology correspondent Tom Cheshire will report on the response of the multinational companies to Alex's report into the way that cobalt is mined and used. Well, last week it was Tony Blair. Today, another former Prime Minister had issued a strident warning about Brexit. Sir John Major sharply criticised the government's handling of Britain's departure from the EU and urged Theresa May to inject a little more charm and a lot less cheap rhetoric. Our political editor, Faisal Islam, reports. Another bruising Brexit intervention from a former Prime Minister, this time from Theresa May's own party. Sir John Major pleading with the PM to do more to protect the UK's interests. Behind the diplomatic civilities, the atmosphere is already sour. A little more charm and a lot less cheap rhetoric would do much to protect the interests of the United Kingdom. Which rather sounded like a reference to Brexit means Brexit. Sir John Major warning Theresa May about her new Brexiteer friends. Although today they may be allies of the Prime Minister, the risk is that tomorrow they may not. Downing Street slapped down the speech, saying the Prime Minister set out her 12 negotiating objectives for Brexit in January. We have a clear plan to get the best deal for the UK and are going to get on with the job of delivering it. Thank you very much. Sir John's intervention comes at a time when other leading Conservative grandees are part of the opposition in the Lords, who could cause an imminent Article 50 upset. The former Maastricht rebels, now the establishment. I think rather like Tony Blair and Michael Heseltine, um, they're not to be taken very seriously. Uh, they've got it wrong consistently. All that matters because the government is set to lose a vote here in the House of Lords on Wednesday. They'll defy the government and the Commons by amending the Article 50 bill and unilaterally guaranteeing the rights of EU citizens already in the United Kingdom. Around 2.7 of the 3.5 million EU nationals already have a broad right to permanent residence, having lived in the UK for five years. But new figures show that since Brexit, 18,500 applications have been refused, with applications up sevenfold to 32,481 and refusals up fivefold on last year to 8,618 in the final three months of 2016. This just one of the issues the Lords is set to defy the Prime Minister over at a time when three of her predecessors are questioning her Brexit strategy. Faisal Islam, Sky News.
And Faisal is in Downing Street for us tonight. So strong words there, Faisal, from one Conservative Prime Minister to another. Absolutely no surprise that these are Sir John Major's views about Brexit. I was there when he gave an emotional speech the night before the referendum, saying that the Leave campaign would be accountable for years for what he called their lives. So no surprise about that. Some surprise, though, about the tenor of his uh, attack, of his criticism, implicit and fairly explicit at times, about how Theresa May has handled the first stages of this Brexit process, questioning exactly her statesmanship, questioning her approach, and questioning, crucially, the idea that Britain and Br the Britain's, British economy could survive uh, intact with a World Trade Organization-style tariffs and trades. He's very worried about that, and he said, and I quote, He's watched with growing concern as the British people are promised too much. More from where that came. Faisal in Downing Street, thank you. Well, Sky News can reveal another warning about the impact of Brexit tonight, this time from business leaders. Our economics editor, Ed Conway, is here. So what's this warning then, Ed? Well, it's from the British Chambers of Commerce, and they are concerned, in fact, their members are concerned about the impact of Brexit uh, on the business community. I mean, we've, we've heard a lot, haven't we, about we haven't Brexited Yes, and indeed the UK hasn't left the EU. I mean, that hasn't formally happened. But for many businesses, they need, need to take kind of decisions about what their arrangements are going to be, whether they're trading, whether they're doing business with the continent or indeed elsewhere around the world. And what the, the BCC report shows is that many businesses are moving their investment, in the case of Northern Ireland, moving it across the border uh, into Ireland in some cases, setting up shadow companies uh, if they need to. And their concern is that they want to minimise those trade barriers that the UK is going to have uh, with the rest of the world in future. So they want to keep as few trade barriers uh, as possible. They want to clarify customs rules uh, as well. So essentially to make it clear about what the trading arrangements are going to be and to ensure that there, is, there are enough people to actually administer them. And finally, to try and secure rights for those workers who are already here from the EU. The government has said that it's going to wait before clarifying that, but for the time being, the businesses, they want more clarity about that. So there is some concern from businesses about that. Uh, and we're likely to hear more from the BCC about that tomorrow. Ed Conway, thank you. The public inquiry into historical allegations of child abuse has held its first public hearings today and was told about the unacceptable depravity meted out to British children who were sent to Australia after the Second World War. One spokesman for the survivors broke down and urged the inquiry to name the villains behind the abuse. Our Home Affairs correspondent Mark White reports. We all came from very, very poor families and then we were put on a luxury liner, the P&O and Orient SS Strathaird, uh, five course lunches and six course dinners. But when we got to Australia, it was a totally different picture. David Hill left the UK for Australia in 1959. His initial excitement was soon replaced by a sense of horror at the conditions he found there and the abuse he suffered. We were put into cottages that were like barracks. Uh, there was no lounge room furniture. There was no lounge. Uh, there were no floor coverings, there were no bedside tables, there were no pillows. David was placed here at Fairbridge Farm in New South Wales. For three years he suffered sexual and physical abuse. The typical Fairbridge kid was eight or nine. The youngest were only four and they never saw their parents again. And they spent an entirely loveless childhood where nobody put a warm arm around them, gave them encouragement, nurtured them, supported them. David Hill is one of a small number of migrant child abuse survivors who've travelled to the UK to give evidence to the independent child abuse inquiry here. In the Orient liner Ormond, British child migrants catch their first glimpse of Sydney. The opening day heard how 150,000 British youngsters were promised a new start, a life full of potential in Commonwealth countries. In many cases, the reality was horrific, betrayed and abused by the very people who should have protected them thousands of miles from home. It is impossible to resist the conclusion that some of what was done there was of quite exceptional depravity, so that terms like sexual abuse are too weak to convey it. This was not about truly voluntary migration, but forced or coerced deportation. For the thousands who endured the most appalling abuse and exploitation, this hearing represents their best hope at shining a light on those years of suffering. 
And after many false starts and years of delay, this huge, wide-ranging child abuse inquiry is finally underway. Mark White, Sky News. And we're expecting that story to feature in tomorrow's newspapers, taking a first look at the front pages in our press preview at 10.30 with the consultant editor of the Daily Mail, Andrew Pearce, and the associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kevin McGuire. The Tunisian government has apologised to the families of 30 British tourists who died in a beachside terror attack in 2015. But speaking to Sky News ahead of the end of the official inquest into their death, the country's tourism minister insisted the country is safe enough for tourists to return. Our Middle East correspondent Alex Rossi has this special report from the Tunisian resort of Sousse. The beach in Sousse appears neglected. But despite the sense of dereliction, there's nothing to indicate that a massacre took place here. Images from that day show the IS terrorists stalking the sands as holidaymakers scatter. It took security forces at least 30 minutes to arrive. One of the investigators for the Tunisian government says better planning could have saved lives. <laughs> توقع الخطر وإعداد السيناريو أشخاص بمظهر مش أمني ما يقلقش السواح وجاهز للرد في كل لحظة كان ممكن أنه يقتل اثنين ثلاثة ويموت But the Minister of Tourism Salma Alumi Rakik insists security's now been improved It's happened here and in other countries and uh, we apologize. Do you concede that mistakes were made, that the number of deaths could have been limited if the security forces had done their jobs properly? It's difficult to make an, evalu an evaluation when you see what is going in other countries and the number of victims in, uh, uh, in Europe, in France, in Belgium, in other countries too, even in the United States. It's difficult to... Uh, to, to uh, to say that uh, there is a mistake or that now, from now, we know that you can face this kind of situation. I was seeing blood everywhere, dying people. Whilst Tunisia's security forces may have been slow to act, many hotel workers did risk their lives. Yes, it goes on. Everyone feels sad. In my family too, in France, they feel sad and they feel guilty. Since the attacks, which left 38 people dead, including 30 British tourists, the resorts have been almost empty. The impact of terrorism on the Tunisian economy has been catastrophic. Now, this is the beach in Sousse where the attack took place in 2015. It's low season now, but on a good year, it would be pretty busy. And this is the hotel where it happened. Perhaps not surprisingly, it is still closed. But the hotel next to it, is also closed. In fact, 17 of the 96 hotels in Sousse have had to shutter their doors. After um, the Sousse attack, uh, the, uh, there were five terrorist attacks in Turkey, in France, but people did not stop going there. Hoteliers say the attack was a tragedy, but in an age where terrorism is universal, they claim Tunisia is being unfairly singled out as an unsafe destination. Alex Rossi, Sky News, Seuss. The NHS in England is spending tens of millions of pounds on a few hundred agency staff. Health bosses say that 500 agency staff earn at least £150,000 a year. They're calling for greater transparency around pay for the workers, who includes some doctors. A new national target has been set to reduce agency spending. Tributes have been paid to the Labour MP, Sir Gerald Kaufman, who's died from a long-term illness aged 86. The Prime Minister said he would be missed for his wisdom and experience. Sir Gerald's death leaves Labour facing another by-election, but in one of its safest seats. Donald Trump is hoping to raise defence spending by 10% next year, a rise of more than £40 billion. It would be unusual to see such a big increase when America is not fighting a major war. Well, Siobhan Robbins is life for us in Washington. Is this another campaign promise being met then, Siobhan? 
Well, certainly that's what Donald Trump would argue. This is what he talked about during his campaign. Uh, but now he has today said he's got this idea that he can increase defence spending by $54 billion. Of dollars. Now, that is just an idea, not a budget. But he said he won't put America into debt to do that. So he's going to look to claw back that $54 billion from uh, other uh, federal budgets. He also said that he will cut foreign aid spending. But foreign aid spending is only 1%. So people are very concerned that other domestic budgets could be seriously squeezed. So is the extra money for anything specific? Well, it does seem like Donald Trump is looking for some sort of military supremacy. He's said several times now he wants to boost America's nuclear capability. He also um, said today that they don't win wars anymore, that he wants to win more wars. And today the Pentagon's been feeding back its ideas on how to fight Islamic State. So people will be asking, is that one of the wars that he's talking about? On the campaign trail, he talked about bombing the Islamic State. But people are asking now, is he also thinking of sending more troops to Iraq and Syria? And if he does so, that could be extremely costly as well as extremely dangerous. Shvoon in Washington, thank you. Well, still to come on News at 10. The couple responsible for the biggest mistake in Oscars history. We have the winners in sealed envelopes that we hold and maintain throughout the evening and hand those to the presenters. But first, the Health Secretary Jeremy Hunt has insisted that no patients were put at risk after the NHS mislaid 700,000 NHS files. NHS England is investigating whether the safety of around thousands of patients was compromised by delays to their diagnosis or from taking the wrong drugs. Our senior correspondent David Bowden reports. Blood test results, cancer screening details and biopsy reports, all among the data which went missing because the company that was supposed to deliver them to GPs didn't do its job properly. Something Dr Rebecca Dowdy says all adds to the pressure on surgeries. For us, we're at a time where we have very few GPs, so trying to deal with the extra workload of chasing up test results and um, information from patients' records that may have been done in the past which is information that patients need, so it then impacts on them because we're having to chase things, we can't give instant answers, we're having to ask patients again for stuff they need. We may have had a delay to referrals. The records went missing between 2011 and 2016. In all, more than half a million pieces of medical correspondence were misplaced. NHS England says 2,500 of them had potential risk of harm to patient care. The day-to-day -day barkle meant a summons for the Health Secretary to the House of Commons. We take full responsibility as a government because we were responsible at the time, but the measure of the competence of a government isn't when suppliers do things, uh, when suppliers make mistakes. I could gently remind him it did happen a few times when Labour were running the NHS. Mr Speaker, he can't deliver the investment our NHS needs. He can't deliver a social care solution. He can't deliver patient safety. And now he can't even deliver the post. The private firm responsible for mishandling the data is a joint venture between the Department of Health and a French company, Sopra Steria, whose UK headquarters are here in Hertfordshire. On its website, it says that it has a £1 billion 10-year deal with the UK Cabinet Office and works with various government departments, including the Home Office, the Ministry of Justice and DEFRA. The company even promotes its partnerships on YouTube. We partner with our clients to improve outcomes. NHS Shared Business Services, a joint venture with the Department of Health for Business Support Services, has already delivered more than £224 million in cost and efficiency savings. So far, no one seems to have suffered medically from the temporary loss of data, but it's yet another setback to an already struggling NHS. David Bowden, Sky News. Millions of young drivers could soon be priced out of owning their car after insurers warned that premiums could rise by as much as £1,000. The increase is being put down to a government ruling and changes to the way personal injury compensation payments are calculated, as Dan Whitehead explains. We all know running a car isn't cheap, and now insurance looks set to rise because of a change in how personal injury payouts are calculated. So why is our car insurance going up? Because of personal injury claims. 
or when a lump sum is paid out to a claim, a 2.5% slice of the cake is taken out beforehand. It's to account for the interest which a victim could earn if they invested the money. But now that 2.5% slice is being cut to minus 0.75%, meaning insurance companies are going to have to dish out more. To compensate, insurers say policies such as car insurance will have to go up and motorists aren't happy. Some people have built up no claims, they've been driving for a while and never had any issues, so it's just like, why am I now having to pay more? Petrol, diesel, road use, um, the cost of the vehicle in the first place, all very high, and, uh, and yeah, it just makes it worse, really. The increase in personal injury payouts is good news for claimants, and lawyers say it's long overdue. We're talking about people who've been severely injured, life-changing industries, and I'm sorry, that's where we should be focusing, not on big business. But shares in insurance companies fell on the news. They say that while payouts are important, they need to be fair for everyone. If we're going to perform that function and ensure for society as a whole that we have affordable uh, premiums for motorists, particularly for young drivers who need affordable car insurance so that they can work, uh, as well as for older drivers to keep them on the road as long as they wish to be on, then we have to have a balanced system. The change in personal injury payments by the government could also land the NHS with a billion pound bill. The new rate kicks in on March the 20th. Dan Whitehead, Sky News. Now it had all the ingredients for a classic screwball comedy, two leading actors, a memorable mix-up, the wrong envelope and Hollywood's most prestigious award. But the organisers of the Oscars didn't see the joke and today the accountancy firm at the centre of the biggest awards blooper of them all apologised. From Hollywood, Greg Mullen reports. For best picture. <laughs> You're impossible. <laughs> Come on. La La Land. <laughs> If only there'd been an Oscar for the most extraordinary Academy Awards moment ever, there'd have been only one winner. Moonlight, best picture. The inquest into this has now begun. In the dock, Brian Cullinan and Martha Ruiz, tabulators for the accounting firm PwC and guardians of those envelopes. So let's try to unpick all that chaos. People everywhere. As La La Land's makers gave their acceptance speeches, the truth is dawning behind them. Envelopes are checked, looks exchanged, enter Brian and Martha. As seconds pass, there is frantic toing and froing, and as the real winners announced, Brian and Martha are there to witness it all, with the watching millions in shock. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. Moonlight won. Come on, this is not a joke. In a statement, PwC said the presenters had mistakenly been given the wrong category envelope and when discovered was immediately corrected. We are currently investigating how it happened and deeply regret that this occurred. It all backs up what presenter Warren Beatty said. I want to tell you what happened. I opened the envelope and it said, Emma Stone, La La Land. That's why I took such a long look at Faye and at you, I wasn't trying to be funny. <laughs> the wrong envelope was still in his hand. Luckily, there were no hard feelings. Of course, you know, it was an amazing thing to hear La La Land. I think we all would have loved to win Best Picture, but we are so excited for Moonlight. I think it's one of the best films of all time. For PwC, so proud of their reputation for protecting the secrets of Oscars night, it is deeply embarrassing. There are 24 categories. We have the winners in sealed envelopes that we hold and maintain throughout the evening and hand those to the presenters. Compounded for the Academy by using the picture of a woman who is alive in a tribute to a costume designer and friend who isn't. The red carpet is now gone for the year, and for an event that prides itself on being slick and being right, this is a bad day. They always want the Oscars to be a night to remember. That one will be hard to forget. Greg Milam, Sky News, Hollywood. Well, that was News at 10. Coming up, the front pages of all tomorrow's newspapers with the consultant editor of the Daily Mail, Andrew Pearce, and the associate editor of the Daily Mirror, Kev Maguire. That's next.